Max Verstappen wins the 2024 Constructors World Championship. Is this the spiciest race of the season? Your occasional spicy hot take of the latest F1 rumours, Tin Foil Helmets is back for another week, all with the most believable conspiracy theories to back them up. Everything here is carefully researched for hours to make sure it is totally founded in logic, reason and truth. Or not. Who knows? All right, well, I think we need to jump right in with Singapore because uh, in... I'll just blame jet lag or some other things, but I think we need to have a Singapore rapid fire for everything we forgot to talk about. So I'll tee you up and feel free to give me your quick thoughts on something. Are you ready? Got it. Okay. Helmut Marco wants Massa to be awarded the 2008 championship because, quote, Lewis doesn't care about records. Marco's still upset about Toto's comment about Wikipedia. He really is. Uh, Max avoided penalties in qualifying. Because they don't want to spend months talking about it, so they just let him get away with it. That's probably fair. Uh, Checo was playing bumper cars, like taking out Yuki, and he avoided a bunch of penalties. And uh, no, we're not talking about Japan yet. Uh, he did that because he's scared of Yuki taking his seat. I could see that. Uh, Lewis had the best shortcut on lap one ever. I'm surprised he gave that position back. He should have had a penalty. Oh, uh, and apparently Merck didn't show up to the podium for Lewis? Apparently they didn't show up in it, uh, Bahrain either. What's going on here? Apparently it was just the camera angle. I'm sure it was, Mercedes. I'm sure it was. Anyway, g- glad we could clear all of that Singapore stuff we miss, or uh, all the stuff we missed from Singapore up. Let's move on to Japan. Did we get anything right? Red Bull World Constructors Champions. Check. I mean, that was, that was a no-brainer. Although, it did get touch and go there for a minute. Only because, like, Perez was not going to score any points. There, there was a moment in that race where you could believe that maybe they would slip up. Especially if the car fell apart. But there was just a moment, just a, a hint, a, a, a wisp. But no, it was a slam dunk. Clearly going to happen. I mean, what, it was 24 points, so like pretty much they needed a second and a third and a, a fastest lap in there as well, pretty much. just to. Like... He, he could have got a puncture. There was all that debris everywhere. He could have got a puncture. He could have. Uh, the Max Verstappen podcast uh, was back. Correct. And there were so many references to the Max Verstappen podcast. I did not expect you to call the second half of this right, but good work on uh, Lando and Piastri there. But it turns out, most importantly, Max does not like podcasts. No, he doesn't. Uh, but but I did like Lando apparently appreciates the format because he was along the lines of, oh yeah, uh, and new new guest Oscar Piastri. George out qualifies Lewis and bins it. Did he out qualify? Did he, he? He didn't out. He didn't. Yeah, Lewis out qualified George. But uh, I'd say George kind of binned it. Even he, he metaphorically binned the race, if not literally. He did. He made a strategic error, just like he did in Singapore. Except in Singapore, it was more of a wall-related strategy error. The, there was a great tweet that might be a little mean, but bears sharing, of that George Russell has the ego of Michael Schumacher and the talent of Ralph Schumacher. It was so mean, but there is, there is uh, in every joke, there is a hint of truth. There is a hint of truth. Um, yeah, May- maybe, uh, maybe that's what happens when you hang out with Mick Schumacher all the time. Oh, there you go. Family resemblance. Uh, touch of greatness. We, knew, we always knew it was going to be the case, but there were so many good hats from the Japanese fans. I love the fact that they are just, they're broad-based. They're not like, you know... There are the three people who turn up every year with the great hats, or it's one team's worth of stuff. Somebody always turns up with a great selection of hats from all the different people. People wearing full race suits, people wearing race helmets, wearing fake helmets, taking helmets that shouldn't be helmets and making them into my helmets. And then there was even the strange people with Alvatore who had a uh, DRS on the top of their head, which is very impressive, especially it was fully functioning. I definitely love the DRS helmet on top of the head. That was fantastic. Yes. Anyway, there was some between race drama. Should we get to that? I think we should get into the drama. There was a, there was a surprising amount of drama for only a week between races. There was. Uh, uh, so let's start. First, uh, Oscar Piastri getting his contract not only for the next year, but into 2026, which is a pretty long time. And just a totally stress-free contract announcement, just like we've come to expect from things with Oscar. Exactly. There's, there's no... It's just every year is smooth as butter. Uh I think it's interesting that Zach is locking up drivers yet again. Uh, I think it is also very interesting that it's also the year after Lando leaves. Um, I mean, sorry, his contract is supposed to uh, run out. Uh, But I think that's quite interesting. I think that could be very smart trying to get them to have some continuity of drivers while they try to ramp up the new one because Lando's gone to Red Bull. 
Oscar did not have a bad weekend like some people when they renew their contracts. Indeed, it was a lot of bad, bad weekend renewals this weekend. Um, but the last point on Oscar, I think this pretends uh, the, to the inevitable uh, universe writing itself and making sure that McLaren slides down the uh, order next year. Which I believe later in this podcast you have a, ca- a counterpoint to this, um, but I'm going to go with the universe that likes a bad story. So, oh, I think the universe likes a good story. Yeah, you say that, but but that's that's a that's another comment. If if the universe liked good stories or uh, but liked bad stories, I don't know. There'd be a lot more weirder things happening in sports. So. True. This is the this is the place where the universe makes its exception to its rule of bad stories. Yes, if the uh, universe liked bad stories, the Patriots would have gone 17-0, and 0, and instead uh, they lost to the Giants in that one Super Bowl. Or to quote uh, a, a, an NFL commercial for, uh, it, uh, with Tom Brady recently, it was, if you think this is, do you think this is scripted? Do you think I would have allowed myself to lose to eat or Peyton's little brother twice in the Super Bowl? Fantastic. <laughs> anyway, before we turn into a football podcast uh let's talk about lance uh lance posted a tweet saying thank you for all the nice messages uh i have a question on this one which is did anybody actually send any nice messages to lance stroll um it feels like somebody is trying to manifest nice messages by saying that they had in fact happened um i also think it was very suspicious that this felt very much like a reaction to the fake rumor going around that lance was going to was not going to partake in uh this weekend's race uh, and Felipe Drogovic was going to take his place I think this is very suspicious and it feels very drama like I think there's a lot there's a lot more going on behind the scenes than we know I mean we wished him well on our podcast I believe I, I think we said you know it, it's it's rare to see a driver sit out for just being sore but we hope he's he gets better and can be back I, I, I believe we said a nice message towards Lance Stroll about him feeling better but you see, this is this is the subtle problem, right? Was was that really our message, or we were just like you know gaslighting him? Uh, I I mean, I don't want anybody to be hurt. I I, no, I wanted no. him to get better. But but remember, he is a regular featurette in our. Does Blank still have a job? So. Oh, let's. We're not there yet. Okay. Uh, anyway, I thought this was interesting, especially as it seemed delayed and it was very strange. There was something not quite right about it. Yeah. Well, I I could. I mean, there are fi- every F1 driver seems to have some fans. I can imagine Lance has some fans. Oh, I'm sure. um, uh, other other billionaire children need somebody like them to root for. True. So you know, I can I can see Lance having some friends, oh, fans. It must have been a message from Latifi saying, "Good job putting it in the wall." There you go. Yeah. Uh, next item uh, looks like Andretti Racing is one step closer to becoming a Formula One team. Uh, it was reported this week. The, that the FIA rejected the proposals of High Tech, Rodin, who uh, are popular in F2, well not popular, they drive teams in F2 and F3 I think, and then a team that I'm not going to pronounce and I will uh, defer to you, uh, financed by somebody with a lot of zeros after their bank account. License? Ooh, close, but there's a K in there. Anyway, uh, yeah, I think that's great for Andretti, I think it's great for the sport, uh, I, look, I look forward to them being uh, on the grid and it sounds great. Yep, no, I think I think we need more teams. Uh, we don't need a lot more teams, but we need some more teams. But it definitely proves they've done everything right along the way because, you know, you, the the team that we failed to pronounce their name of properly, like they're financed by a billion-dollar hedge fund, which sounds like a great place to be uh, to become a Formula One team because, you know, how do you be, make a million dollars running a Formula One team? Start with a billion dollars. Boom! Right? And so, but it definitely seems like, you know, Andretti, they've... They, they've definitely shown that they are serious about joining and serious about what it takes, and and the FIA has seen that, and I'm happy. Yep, no, hopefully this, hopefully the F1 uh, Liberty Media does not have a moment and decide not to do this. This, this. this needs to happen, even if they are not super successful, it needs to happen. And uh, my favorite bit of between race drama was apparently that Toto tried to convince Williams to hire Mick Schumacher for next season, and they even sent him simulator, or they sent James Bowles simulator data, and he just went, nah. I, I, I want to know more details on this, because the fact that James Bowles knew, did actually know, Mick Schumacher was in F1 last year, wasn't he? It was only this year that he was out, so there wasn't quite the correlation there. But that's, that, that's kind of surprising, and I don't, I don't think Mick is that bad. Um, I think it's also very difficult when he was in a terrible car last year, so. No, but but I think it's very interesting for Toto to send another team some of your simulator data. Well, at least in this case, he knows he's not really revealing anything super secret, right? 
because he's probably driving the simulator for the last for the last year and James Vowles has seen all that data so I don't think it's that interesting yeah it, it's still I still think it's a little bit interesting just because like sending your competitor sim data to try to get you to hire a uh, a driver and you know it would be very interesting if Toto got this done given what he did for Alcon as well he really is kind of the uh the good me the good hearted stepdad of the uh of the paddock exactly he's he's willing to try and find his 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 drivers a position somewhere even if it requires compromising his own team which i think is actually uh, pretty good which in hindsight is starting to look exactly what happened like when he got rid of Valtteri Bottas and sent him to Alfa Romeo but we'll talk about that later uh, last item on here, I thought this was interesting. Somebody uh, not into F1 sent this to me. Uh, DTM, the German sports car people, um, is a preview of the efforts that F1 teams will go to once Tire 1 was banned. Specifically, the DTM has had to issue a clarification in the rule sets that you are not allowed to use sunlight to warm your tires. Uh, this year, they had banned tire warmers in DTM uh, to the point now that teams are now, A, putting the tires on the rack and walking them to the grid early so that they can sit out in the sunlight and warm up. They've got special black tents that they put over the tire rack to help it increase the ambient heat around it and a whole host of other different things. And it's just like life will always find its way in motorsport racing. And I thought it was pretty interesting because you know you know somebody's going to get done for this in F1 when they get rid of the tire warmers. Uh, they haven't gone far enough. You need to put some nice mirrors on top of your pit wall uh, thing to reflect the sun back into the garage. Indeed. Suddenly we've all got glossy monitors on the pit wall. I wonder how that happened. And why can't I see anything on the monitor anymore during the bits where they're trying to warm up the tires? No, Dominic, this is our push for uh, for zero. We've put solar panels up there. They just happen to oh, reflect light back. There we go. But we're trying to there power this, uh, our, our, our pit wall off of solar, you know, as our push towards zero comes through, comes true. So on a very serious point on this, I don't think we should get rid of tire warmers because I think it's going to lead to a bunch of people smashing into other people and I don't like it when they do that. But that's what they should do. They should say, you can heat your tires, but you are only allowed to use these solar panels that are regulatory, regulatorily mandated to be a certain size, certain efficiency, etc., etc. But the power from those solar panels can only be used to heat the tires. And so if you're in, I don't know, Silverstone and it's raining and it's cloudy well I'm sorry your tires don't get warmed up but if you happen to be in I don't know Monza and it's bright and sunny and your tires get warmed up good for you that's the way to do it net zero saves all the time but doesn't risk as much drivers as much I I would go one step further and just say that you can heat the tires but it has to be done by a a guy on a stationary bike (laughs) (laughs) that is the cycling crossover you've been waiting for exactly um but yeah no because uh like you start to see weird applications of cyclists in like america's cup uh yacht racing of like they found it's a good way i think it was i think it's like moving sails or something like because they used to like hand crank everything right they find out it's a lot more efficient to like have little stationary bikes there that they sit and spin on what this is a real thing uh no watts what yeah yeah I'm going to have to look this up after the show because I, I, I just, just the idea of somebody sitting on a bicycle on the top of one of these super things as it's tilting and going around just seems. Oof. It, it's it's in the it's in the the pontoons of the the catamaran. Oh, oh, so that they're below decks. They are literally slaves. Um, I mean, as much as there is a below deck on one of those racing catamarans. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the great shipping people continue to do what they always did, which is cram people in the bottom and hope that they do something for them. Hey, I went to a whole museum today about a boat that only made it 1,500 meters. It was fantastic. What was this boat? Do I want to know this? It's the uh, Vasa Museum in Stockholm, and it's, uh, there's a, 60, a ship from the 1600s that made it uh, 1,500 meters before it just fell and sank into the Stockholm Harbor, and they pulled it up in the 60s, and it's now a museum, and it was really good. Fascinating. You will have to send me the link after that, so I'm going to have to go read about that because I have so many questions. It, oh, yeah. All right, shall we move on to uh, our next occasional segment that we do every week? Uh, does Blank still have a job? I would like it noted for the record and for our listeners that the moment there's nobody in danger of getting fired is the moment we will remove this section. Just want it noted, it is not a permanent section. This is sport. Everybody, somebody is always in danger of losing their job. No, not always. Sometimes we have a good field and everything looks good, but we don't know when that might be. It will happen. It will be, it will, the, sun will, the sun will shine, the clouds will part. And the um, angels will sing, and we will know that, that day is a thing. And then we will remove it. But we will never remove quality recap or race recap or spicy takes, FYI. I mean, I guess there's a chance Alpine leaves, 
Lance gets off the grid and Ferrari hire a competent team of strategists and race engineers, and then, yes, we'll have nobody in, in the segment. But exactly. But until that dark day when hell has frozen over, this is going to be a segment for a while. Exactly. But I just want it reiterated. It's occasional. It's not permanent. Anyway, uh, let's get started. Uh, so, should we start with the favorite uh, at the moment, or should we go in reverse order? I don't know who the favorite is, so let's go uh, reverse order. I'll let you... Reverse order as seen by Dominic. Okay, let's start with the stewards. Do the stewards still have a job? Uh, they kind of went a bit weird in Singapore, and they didn't do a great job this week either. No, they didn't, but I, at least they came out after Singapore and said, wow, we really screwed that one up. We'll try to do a better job from now on, which um, I think is good. Crofty was saying that like they very clearly wanted to say this was not precedence. They weren't going to let Singapore set precedence of so just screwed up. But, you know, there are a couple incidents today. Um, the Mercedes battling with each other. Um, at least, uh, insert other example here um, that I feel like they missed. Yep. I also feel that they were took a while for some of these to, to get them out. Although maybe they were quicker than normal. It felt a little, little, little weird and inconsistent in both timing and when they wanted to do it. Um, I personally feel it's a bit strong uh, Michael Massey 2021 vibes. Maybe even 2020. There was that slight inconsistency, sometimes harsh, sometimes not. I got that. That was an echo of that. Not that we're saying it is Michael Massey bad, but it was definitely uh, different this week. Oh, the other example would be uh, Charles Leclerc overtaking George Russell off the track. Ah, yes. And gain. They did They did note it and then chose no further investigation. It's very suspicious. Yeah, that was going to be a hard one to like take back because George was going back anyway, but... Yeah, Charles was clearly outside track limits, but I think there was definitely space for him to be inside track limits and still get it done, so I can understand why they passed. Yep. Uh, next on the list, going again in reverse order, is Perez. Uh, Liam to the Red Bull Red, uh, Red Bull seat. Um, I mean, Perez had another no good very or very bad weekend. We can talk about more of that later. Uh, yeah, I can't. I... I... I have to question if when they're sitting around having a conversation about this, how they really feel about Perez. Because it's, he did a great job in year one and year two. I think he did a great job. But this year, it's just like, what is going on? Uh, I think I had something later down, uh, but it might not have made it. Uh, But, oh, maybe it's just something I sent to you. But it was very clearly, like Christian Horner said something of like, Essentially, Perez will not be in the seat after 2024. Oh, I missed that. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was a. It was essentially... Um... I remember you... Somebody, either I saw or you sent it to it, where he said he was evaluating all the options, not necessarily that Perez wouldn't be in the seat. Oh, yeah. There it is. Okay. Uh, so it's... Uh, I, I, I had a slightly more cyn- less cynical read on that, but it's definitely looking a bit dicey for Mr. Checo Perez. Yeah, it was, uh, Christian Horner reveals they're keeping all their options open for Red Bull in 2025. We've got a long-term contract with Max. Uh, with Max. Checo is out of contract at the end of 24, so you want to explore and see all the options. Checo is in the hot seat at the moment and will obviously be keen to extend. I read that as Checo wants to extend, they don't want to. Yeah, they're certainly not. They're not slam dunking it, that's for sure. They're not just like, give us a contract and sign the piece of paper. We need to go and do due diligence on this. I, I think if Perez was a Red Bull uh, racing driver similar to Alex Albon or um, the other one, uh, Pierre Gasly, to what they did in 2020, 2019, 2020, where that was, I think he'd already be out of the seat. I think I would agree with that. But I thought he was still contracted to Red Bull Racing. But then again, I suppose your point that you raised in a previous podcast is apparently his contract has a clause that says, I can't be bounced down to Alfa Tori. In, it will be in hindsight very interesting if they do get rid of him whether actually that clause that he thought was so smart that would save him was actually the worst thing for him to stay in F1 and that actually what he will do is he'll get bounced out of F1 because nobody will want to take him that's true yeah because because where does he go if he doesn't stay in the Red Bull he will go to a team who desperately wants to steal Red Bull's um, intellectual property next next is uh, Logan Sargent uh, man did you did you see the qualifying lap where he bent it? Um, I mean, calling that a lap was a strong statement. Oh, ab- absolutely. But you know, drivers when they go off in the way in, with the resultant crash that he had, most drivers like they just lose it and it just goes off, and you're like, man, that sucks. He had it back under control, and then he channeled deeply the the 
apparition of mind control of Jeremy Clarkson appeared in his brain and he just went more power. And so he was just like, he almost had it. And then he's like, you know what? I'm going to put my foot down harder on the accelerator and bump, it went into the wall. It was so bad. It was an absolute total rookie error who, you know, nine months into F1, he should not be making that mistake. That was a really, really, really bad mistake. It's very interesting that his best performances were at... Bahrain, Jeddah, in Australia, which are races 1, 2, and 3. He has pretty much gone downhill since the start of this. Yeah, everybody else has improved around him. Well, not not Aston Martin, but we can get to that. True, true. I will concede that point. Um, I thought it was also very interesting in lots of the video footage that they showed on the TV. Uh, the, the, the engineers who normally look upset when somebody bins it, they didn't just look upset. They looked really, really upset when he binned that. That was... Like, they were like, this is ridiculous. Something tells me he's not buying the mechanics a round of beer every time he bins it. He needs to buy them more than a round of beer. He needs to buy them, like, you know, a full-on, you know, meal and beer every night for the entire time that they are away. That's ridiculous. Uh, It was was really bad. Like, if I had done... Let me rephrase this. If I had been driving my car on a track, that is exactly the stupid mistake I would have made. And I am absolutely not a race car driver, and that makes it look even more shameful. Oh, 100%. If I was driving an F1 car, I would have been in the wall way before he was. I would have done it in exactly the same way he did. Exactly the same way. I'd have been so stupid about it. Uh, I'd be in the gravel trap at Suzuka outside of turn one. I wouldn't be able to hit the wall because I wouldn't be going fast enough uh, because it's too scary. That's where I would be. Would you have made it out of the pit lane? I think I could make it out of the pit lane thanks to the pit limiter. Okay, good job. Yes, excellent point. Uh, I will subscribe to that. And, okay. and, but, and, and I know enough not to immediately plant my foot as soon as I take it off. So I'm not going to go cartwheeling there. The problem is I'm going to slowly accelerate towards turn one, miss my braking with cold brakes, and then go careening off into, into turn one. I will subscribe to that. I think that's exactly likely like 98% of the people who aren't F1 drivers would do. Uh, the other 2% would crash into the pit wall because they just booted it and forgot to press the pit limiter button. But maybe this is uh, an opening for uh, Liam Lawson to go to Williams. For I, indeed, I, 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 if somebody doesn't give Liam a seat next year, uh, it, it's, it's a super shame because that's about the only one left. Yeah, the the other thing that I think is so interesting on this with Liam is he has clearly gotten in that car, and I know they fixed the car recently, but he is clearly driving so much better than Nick DeVries, and uh, it really makes Helmut Marco look like an idiot for picking Nick DeVries, whereas uh, Christian Horner wanted to put Liam in the car. You know, that go that goes back to our theory last week of they're giving uh they're trying to slowly remove helmet and that was a great way of like, yeah, you go ahead, do that thing. Excellent. Put put Nick in the car. Yeah. Uh so I, I hope Liam in he seems to be very good. Um apparently he easy I was a post race interview I saw uh, a recount of this morning where he was interviewed now last by the press, like, oh, how do you feel about beating Yuki, blah, 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 blah. And Liam wasn't like, yeah, look at me. He's like, you know, I'm just disappointed I wasn't able to catch uh, catch the Alpines, which I thought was actually a pretty good piece of media training to not wail on the wail on your other driver's home race. Uh, and then I think finally we have to uh, shout out our, our boy who's been here all season long, uh, Lance Stroll. Oh, yeah, this was... I have strong conspiracy theories about his retirement today strong conspiracy theories which is to say uh let's save that for uh our 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 rumor section of that we love to talk about but uh quali let's talk about quali let's talk about quali uh so uh you should you you should run this one down this one this one can be yours all right uh i loved the max verstappen alternate tire allocation strategy for uh qualifying i i would be a fan of seeing everybody on the grid try it of uh, you get one set of soft tires, do as many runs as you want throughout the uh, throughout the uh, three sessions, and yeah, because what he put on one set of softs for Q1, and then took the same set of softs out for Q2 to do his next run, and was a tenth slower. It was so he was he was so fast still that apparently Anthony Davidson went to go look to say, did he really just do that on a set of used tires? On a, on a track where everybody else was just monching their sauce and couldn't keep them going for a full lap. Which actually leads to the um, why Red Bull apparently had so many problems in Singapore was because of how that track is set up. They couldn't actually, their, their car is so good on tires that it couldn't actually ever heat up the tires. Interesting, because it's such a bouncy track so you don't get the, the contact patch. 
Uh, that and it's like 90 degree corner, 90 degree corner, 90 degree corner. So it's you don't have any of the like high speed sweepers to really warm them I up. I see. I see. You don't have that pressure on the tire over an extended right. period to try and get the heat. Oh, okay, that makes right. Sense. So because it's so because it's so good on its tires, it's so shit around Singapore. I mean, this this is just a classic case of Max being Max. Like that. As, as again, as I'll say it again, as much as I'm no fan of Max, he's a very good driver and knows how to drive the car properly. Uh, I did like apparently that. Um, uh, GP, uh, Max as a race engineer, knows just how to get Max fired up because apparently for his last run in Q3, he told him he didn't think he could get into the 28s. <laughs> the, the, this is what excellence looks like, right? This is where, this is like, no matter your field, whether it's sport, whether it's work, is you have that right relationship where somebody can just push you. Not like, you know, you do a crap job, right? They just leave that little hint for you to push yourself just a little bit further. And it's actually a great thing to watch. Uh, did you see the um, qualifying visualized? I did not. Oh, man, that was incredibly good. Uh, essentially, it's like max and then all the way almost back to like the finish line is um, like there's the there's the checkered line at the start of the grid. And then uh, almost all the way back at like the finish line is everybody else. Like <laughs> it, it was just it's so much time is insane. Those other teams need to pull their head out of their ass and get on with it, right? Like, this is not a question where you need Red Bull to be hobbled. You need everybody else to work out, like, why are they so bad at this? And I am refuse to accept that it's just because they've got Adrian Newey and they need to get on with it. And please, for the love of this sport, please do something about it. Work harder. I, I think Max is just honestly that good because Perez is not a bad driver and he was seven and a half tenths in front. If if you put a if you put a replacement level driver in that Red Bull, it's a really interesting season. If you take Max out and put like Yuki or Daniel or Liam in, like I don't know if Perez wins or Red Bull wins the constructors or drivers championship. But equally true, if the other teams fix their cars, we would have Lewis, we would have George, we would have Carlos, we would have Charles, we would have Lando, we would have piastri all driving the wheels off the car because i think they're all as capable of getting there as max at least on a good day maybe not every day and that would be much more interesting than you know hobbling the team by getting rid of a great driver but anyway shall we move on to other people in quali what if we just give max one step harder tires than everybody else yes this comes back to the whole hobble imbalance of power crap just just make your car better like but but honestly, I wanted I want them to do that at like one race just to see the difference. What if Max like if it's like, you know, especially since the drivers' title is probably going to be sewn up after the sprint race. Just like next or at Qatar next time, just like if, if everybody gets like the C two C three C four, give Max like the three four five or something. Like, you know, just give him one step harder and see what he can do. This is why I want to just randomly rejuggle rejuggle everybody after the championship's been sealed up and see how they drive in different cars. That's what I think these just... Let's really... If we're going to do balance of power, don't balance of power the, the teams. Balance of power the drivers. I would agree with that. Uh, we talked about Logan just bending it. Yeah. Um, man, Aston Martin, they've gone... There was a graphic of, like, they were two seconds faster at Bahrain this year than they were last year, and they were two-tenths faster at Japan this year than they were. I don't know if it's that they've developed badly, which I think is clearly part of it, or whether they've just not, whether they didn't understand what they did in the first place, and therefore that they aren't able to extract what they can from the car. Like a, a combination of those thing, two things, I think, has really hampered them. They definitely slid all the way back. It is very similar to who was it last year? Alfa Romeo last year came out of the gate with this great car. I think Haas did too. And then the rest of the season, they just slowly but surely went backwards. It, it doesn't feel like they've been outdeveloped. It, it definitely feels like they might have just never understood what they had. Yeah, it, it's. I th I always think that's fascinating. I think it's the it's the greatest quandary in F one is you can create a brilliant car, but do you understand how you created the brilliant car? And I think that's the difference that Red Bull ultimately do understand what it is about their car that made it go zoom. And I'm not sure everybody else does. I, I think the closest to another team is to understanding what makes their car behave the way it does is Mercedes. And I'm not sure they've got it, but they're the, they're the closest. They, they don't seem to be able to fix their problems, but I think they understand why it's a bit of a tractor. 
I think McLaren might be up there as well with kind of starting to understand what's going on. I'm still very suspicious. I have so many questions. Like, what what is it that McLaren did, right? Like, I, I completely subscribe to your theory from uh, a previous podcast is like they got rid of the guy whose name I've forgotten, uh, James Key. They got rid of James Key and now all these great ideas that have been bubbling around have come up. But is it, again, it comes back to that, did they luck into these things or is it a true deep understanding about what it is? And the only way we will find out is next year. I agree. Uh, I also think it's crazy with with Aston Martin. If Lance was really only two tenths off Alonso in Q1, but that two tenths was the difference between like 12th and 18th. Yeah, it was a bit... The the midfield has been very tight this year. You are are hundreds away from a few positions and getting eliminated in uh, each uh, session. It's uh, it's easy for me to sit here. It's easy to sit here and go, lol. Lance screwed it up again. He's 18th. He sucks at qualifying. But like, like two tenths off your teammate. That's about as good as you can we can ever hope for. Like you know, if if Perez was two tenths off Max, they'd lock out the front row. Like yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I the, the question here is 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 this is this less about Lance you know having a good job with the car and more about Alonso being in a cranky mood, uh, which we saw later in the race. Not to preview that. Ooh. Um, that's I think a... it's interesting. I think there's, there's something behind the scenes going on there. Uh, next on this list is uh, Alpina in No Man's Land. I don't have a lot to say about this. They have just gone around in a circle and then don't seem to be going anywhere. I assume a large part of this is due to the fact that uh, they've fired everybody on their team. So. Uh, yeah, but it's they're not bad, but they're not good. And that's kind of like a problem. Like, at least if you're around at the back of the field, it's like, well, you know, we're trying things. We can do alternate things. And if you're at the front, you're at least fighting. And Alpine's just like, we, we have nowhere to go. We, we we don't want to fall back too much, and we can't fight with anybody in front. Yep, 100% agree. Uh, I think the Mercs, are, the Mercs are struggling in qualifying. That's for certain. Yep. Yeah, it's, uh, there's, I mean, I think the car has problems, but it's interesting to see that they've basically, they were going forward with such a great pace, and I think they've they've just stopped going forward. I think they genuinely are thinking about the 2024 car. That's, that's that's the excuse I'm going to give them. Yeah, that strikes me as more they've been outdeveloped or stopped developing rather than they don't know what's going on. Exactly. I agree with that. Uh, anything else or should we go to race recap? Did you want to talk about the McLarens and their cars or do you want to save that for later? I, yeah, okay. Well, we, we talked a little bit about it, but I thought it was interesting. Like, I really want someone to do the tell-all, leak everything and tell us what they did. Because you go back and you look to before uh, Australia... And both Lando and Oscar were terrible. Uh, I went and pulled the stats from uh, Wikipedia with a bit of homework here. Uh, Lando was 17th, 17th, 6th, 9th, 17th, 9th, 17th, 13th before Austria when he got the upgrade. Oscar, I will ignore the retire in the first race because I think his car went pop. Um, 15, 8, 11, 19, 10, 11, 13, 16 before he got the upgrade at Silverstone. I... And then they're like, they're catapulted to the front in the top five, top three, sometimes on the front row. What is going on? I think some of the stats you said are misleading too, because like the sixth and eight were from Australia, which if you remember was like an absolute crazy, like triple red flagged, 10 cars finished affair. And we were speculating at that point in time of like, have they screwed their season? Because like, there's no way they're getting any points. And now they have this bunch of points that like Williams and Haas won't be able to overtake. There was a discussion that Lando needed to quit with McLaren that at the end of 2023. And look where he is now. It's like, oh, yeah, good idea. You got a great car there. Master plan by you, Lando. And it's like, what what happened? I need I need that story. If you have any inside tips, feedback at tinfoilhelmets.com. And now they're 50 points away from Aston Martin for fourth. And Aston Martin's in a bit of a free fall. And <laughs> McLaren looks like they can do no wrong. I, I think there's a good chance, especially given Ferrari's ability to screw up when they're in a really good place, uh, there's a good chance McLaren might get to third, I think, right? I think it's plausible. might be difficult, but it's plausible. It's It, it would be difficult because they are uh, they are 110 points out of third. Definitely not impossible, but not easy. A couple of wins in there, a couple of retirements for Ferrari. It's definitely possible. Well, one of those is. Indeed. Race recap? Sure, let's get into it. It was a bit of a... I, I was thinking before this race started that we really haven't had very many, like, lap one, turn one incidents. And, uh, man, this got off to a crunchy start this weekend. 
Oh, it was it was almost a repeat of Silverstone. Um, it's just that nobody flipped over, and it did involve an Alfa Romeo again this time. But no, 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 no George Russell this year. Um, it was crunchy, and there was bits everywhere, and it ruined a bunch of people's races. Um, everybody was trying to get in the place. Perez was trying to kill Hamilton. It was ridiculous. Uh, I mean, it, I, don't, I, don't, I genuinely think most of it was a mistake, except Perez trying to take out Hamilton. Um, but it did seem like it was more mistakes rather than anything else. At the end of the day, though, I was very surprised. I think it was either Gasly or Ocon who caused the crash, and they didn't get any penalty. It's very strange. Yeah, I don't have much more to say about lap one. Uh, great question here about should VSCs be one full lap at minimum? Because it kind of screwed everybody, didn't it? Everybody thought they were going to get a free pit stop, and then it didn't quite work out. Yeah, I don't think anybody really did. Oscar got, like, kind of a half a free pit stop. He got, like, a five seconds and, like, a ten free pit stop. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I almost feel like VSC should be at least one full lap to kind of make it even for everybody. Um, rather, just a little bit of random luck on where you happen to be when the VSC is out. Here's the question. If it had been one full lap, do you think it would have changed the race result? Except, obviously, for Max at the front. Uh, maybe. Um, maybe. It could have. Because maybe George pits instead, or Lewis pits, and one of them goes on an alternate strategy, apart from a stupid one-stop. An alternate alternate strategy? Right. Uh, plan E. We're on Plan E. Confirm. I, I, I will say they called the VSC pretty quickly. I thought they did, did a relatively good job of doing that. Yeah. The Ballad of Sergio Perez. The Ballad of Sergio Perez. Man, that needs to be his, his biopic. Um, the unauthorized biopic. Let's see. He, he gets damaged on, on the lap one incident. They don't pull him in right away uh, to fix any damage. So they pull him in behind all the safety car. He tries to, when he overtakes cars before the safety car line, thus leading him to a five-second penalty. On the way into the pits. To be on clear. the way into the pits, yes. Uh, comes out, is at the back. Uh, punts Magnuson um on man that was like a that was a that was a very desperate late move hoping for the best that for a move that was never there it felt like he'd been watching Logan Sargent earlier in the race doing that to Bottas and decided I could have a bit of that and pull it off turns out he couldn't no uh and then retires uh they realized they didn't serve his penalty unretires to come back out to then do a lap come in pit serve the penalty go back out do another lap and then retire again uh is japan just our breeding ground to test all the rules and regulations because if you remember last year we all thought it was going to be a half points race uh or be but because the rule is when the race halts and does not resume under red flags while this race finished not full distance like it really feels like um, Japan's just our QA test ground for the rules. It definitely does seem that way. And I'm still confused what they were trying to protect from. Like, I understand that, you know, there could have been a grid penalty, but it doesn't say... No, there, there could have been. Because, like, um, Bernie Collins on the Sky uh, broadcast came out. It was, like, rule 53.5 or something like that. Where if you are awarded a time penalty and you are unable to serve the time penalty, it will carry forward to the next race as a possible grid penalty. Ah, but it didn't say will. It said uh, the steward's discretion may carry forward to the next race. Right, which I could have seen them carrying it forward, but it, it still makes the sense of like, oh, wait, we can just put Sergio back in the car, go drive around for two laps and just void this penalty right out. But, but if we're talking about conspiracy theories, our bread and butter, right? Surely Red Bull would rather he had a grid penalty so that Max is more conclusively able to win in Qatar without having to worry exactly how close Perez is behind him. Let him have a five-place grid penalty and let him just, you know, deal with that stuff and just, you know, makes their life easier to guarantee that they can print some more t-shirts to sell. It feels like, like I, don't underst- I don't understand what their real goal was. Well, it would have need the, the grid penalty would have been applied to the race and Max can now win it in the sprint if Perez does not outscore him by five points. So I think no matter what, uh, Max is going to be the world driver uh, champion by the time we hit the race on Sunday. Certainly by the time we hit the end of the race. Yes. No, I, I think before we hit the start of the race on Sunday, because he'll win it on Saturday. Well, sure, but that, that's the best case scenario. But the worst case scenario is he gets punted off the track by his teammate, and we end up um, without him winning or get scoring any points in the sprint race, in which case we have to wait for the end of the race on Sunday. 
Yes, but that also means Sergio would have to be one, two, or three to outscore Max by five points. It's possible. Don't 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 put don't beat a man down when he's already down. <laughs> uh yeah. Well that was all interesting. Um Yeah, and he so yes, he was given a penalty, but I think he avoided that penalty. I think he did. But it was still very strange. It was very strange. Did did George Russell have his uh Austin twenty fifteen moment this weekend where uh Lewis Hamilton essentially threw the hat at him. I I will say it's not that moment. I feel like this is much more like Spa in 2014. Oh, okay. I think this is the seed. This is the seed that creates the giant rift between the two teammates. Um, I think the most interesting thing in this case is I think Lewis is not that bothered. And I think the way he probably was bothered back in, uh, you know, the 2014, 2013, 15 2016 era where i feel like now he's like i'm a seven time world champion i'm not going to take your crap uh yeah I, I also think this is very interesting from the standpoint of if if mercedes get this car to be at the front of the field i think george and lewis are going to take so many points off of each other in such a way that neither will win the driver's championship so that assumes that George continues to progress at the same performance and is able to extract the most out of the car. And while I think George is very capable at driving the car, I do wonder whether this is where, you know, why Lewis is a seven-time seven world champion will come out. And it actually, the reality is by the time he's got a car that's going on around the car, around the track in circles really quickly and very well, and he loves it, um, he's just going to leave George sitting behind um, Max. And that's what it's going to be about. Yeah, there was also some news of what Lewis is going to go check with the wind tunnel guys to see if they've worked on those changes he was talking about. So I think there's also, we've speculated on this podcast before that behind the scenes, Mercedes was not listening to Lewis and then they have started listening to Lewis again. And I think that puts George on a back foot as, as well. I, I, I think it's cu- interesting to see whether they actually want the same thing from a car and that's really where that dichotomy comes from but you'd have thought just making a great car for everybody to drive and is blah 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 etc would benefit both of them but it feels like that's not actually the case um, I think to a certain extent the statement has always been that um, uh, Max is always able to help handle a crappier car but a fast crappy car and I do wonder whether we may see some of that where Lewis, as long as he's got a fast car, he can get the most out of it. But the problem is, is that car is not fast and therefore he can't extract it. And George, with his three years at Williams, learned how to extract the most out of a crappy car. Which I think those are, those are two different perspectives. Per your comment about GP's um, radio message pushing Max by saying, oh, you can't get a 28. You can go further because you can dig deeper. Um, there was also the rumor I saw on the internet that around the paddock is the claim that Mercedes has gone full Red Bull concept for next year. Um, and I do wonder whether that is a, not mistake is not the right word, but like if, you, if they don't understand it, they won't be able to subsequently improve it because it can't just match Red Bull for this year because Red Bull's going to go ahead next year. They need to go, they need to take that new car further than the current car that Red Bull have. Otherwise it'll be tracing point all over again. Yeah, that's very interesting, especially because in, like, the last formula, like, Red Bull developed this high-rake car, and then everybody slowly developed a high-rake car with the exception of Mercedes. And they were like, oh, we don't, we don't want to do that. So it's very interesting to see that if they have gone full Red Bull concept, that's... It's going to be interesting. Man, does, uh, does Alonso just not like fish? Because he is grumpy in Japan. Man, he was so grumpy. And I, I, I think there's more going on behind the scenes. Um, The spicy take is that he's been told that he has to give up his seat to Yuki in 2026 or 2025 um, because Yuki's going to be there with 2026. He's going to have the Honda engine. So Yuki needs to get in the car. And of course, Lance isn't going to get fired. So it's sorry, uh, Fernando, you're out. Um, I wonder if there's some hint that that's happened. Um, But it still seems strange that he's got so cranky because he he is on the verge of screaming GP2 engine down the phone. Um, Of course, he wouldn't do that because it's the, the engine is in other cars. Uh, but there's definitely something going on there, and I can't I can't work out what it is. Maybe he's just frustrated that he knows that the car could be better, but they can't get it to do it because they don't understand it. Yeah, it's uh, it was so cool to see them up the grid early in the season, and now they're yes nowhere. Yes, yeah, it's, it's not good. Uh, you've got a crazy stat here. Yes, did you know that Lando Norris and George Russell are tied on World Driver Championship points? 
That is ridiculous, especially given uh, George. I'm entitled. Russell's be entitled behavior. I'm very surprised by that because that would is... you like? Would you like another crazy Lando Norris stat? I would. He and Checo Perez had the same amount of second places on the season. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. They don't have the same number of wins, but that is ridiculous. The same number of second places. Which yes. is two, right? Yes, a four. Four. Lando's four. had four second places this year. Yes, Lando has had four wow. second places. I I just looked this up. Wow. He, he he had it in Silverstone, uh, Hungary, Singapore, and now Japan. Oh, I forgot about Hungary. I think I forgot about Silverstone, but I definitely forget about Hungary. And he has now passed. Uh, he has now passed Nico Hulkenberg for uh, most points scored without a win. Oh, that's not a good stat to have. That's not a good stat to have because we know how Nico Hulkenberg has gone. Um, shall we slow do the sl- the slow slide into uh, spicy takes? Uh, well, you said everybody was in a bad mood. Do you want to talk about everybody being in a bad mood? I would love to talk about everybody in a bad mood, and I think this is with a slow slide into spicy takes. Uh, All right, then slide us into our spicy takes. I'm sliding on the spicy sauce. Um, everybody just seemed in a really bad mood. Like, all the teammates were mad at each other. There was Ocon and Gasly, they were mad at each other. There was, um, Max and Perez all getting up in each other's business before they all went horrible and everybody was cranky. You had George and Lewis, everybody being cranky. And then McLaren's with Piastri and Norris were all bad. And everybody was just like, bleh, and wasn't very happy about it. And I just feel like the, it was, it was the worst mood i've sensed all season and i wonder whether it's because in singapore they were all stuck or stayed on the euro time zone therefore they didn't really hit the jet lag but this week they've gone to the japanese time zone and they all got jet lagged and they only had an extra week to adjust to it and they're all just just, 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 just a bad mood they got out of bed the wrong side it was, it was very curiously cranky yeah maybe um which is weird because apparently they all love driving at suzuka so you know it's it's weird to be cranky it is a good track. It is a good track. It's a great track. It's so much fun. Uh, it's very hard to drive in the game when I've driven it in the game. It's getting, getting it right is you have to try. Yeah, no, I, maybe maybe that's why they're all cranky. It's just because, like, Suzuka is so hard to get right that, like, you know, it, it's not here are the three corners of Monza. It's, you know, you got to get Suzuka right, and they're all cranky because they're supposed to be professional drivers and they don't feel like they're getting Suzuka right. Yeah. Uh, my last pre-spicy take for about the races. This was the spiciest race of the season, and I mean that in a positive way. I feel like of all the races in the season, and I know Singapore was, in in hindsight, quite a good race, but somehow boring last week. This was all round, genuinely, almost every lap or every other lap was fun and interesting, and there was something going on, and we were watching, and there was no super crazy strategy calls where everybody was just playing the long game. Everybody just drove around, and they tried to overtake each other. It was great, uh, and it was spicy, and everybody was cranky. It was, it was lovely. Lovely. I don't know. George trying to do a one-stop was a bit uh, aggressive. It, it was, but it didn't, it didn't involve him just sitting there and driving around the track I mean, until he started to go backwards. I did like signs being like, ah, he's, he wants, he's trying to do my move. You know, that's one thing we haven't talked about in this whole race recap, which was that call, the call to switch them for the Mercedes team. What was your take on that? Was it the right call? Did, did Toto, by telling them over the radio from wherever, what hot beach he's sitting on, did he make the right call? Or was he just favoring his chosen boy, Lewis? Ooh, I think the better question there is, is Lewis his chosen boy? Because I don't think Lewis is his chosen boy. I think uh, I think Lewis was Nicky Lauda's chosen boy. I think George is Toto's chosen boy. So why would Toto make that call then? Because I think I think I think it was the right call. Because I think unlike unlike Singapore, which is a hard track to overtake on, there are overtaking opportunities, especially coming out of the traction zones, uh, going onto like the back straight, going into one thirty R. Uh, there's some possibilities coming in and out of the S's. And I think George's tires were falling off a cliff so quickly that I think it was only going to be a matter of time until Lewis came around. Or if Lewis was trying to protect George, Carlos was going to get between them. I think he was going to get both of them. Yeah, I think he would have too. But So I think it was definitely the right call to switch him around and essentially put George between him and Lewis, just or between Lewis and Carlos for a minute 
just to kind of slow Carlos enough to get Lewis to go up the road and make it a little bit harder for Carlos to overtake. But then Lewis, being the team player that he is, did actually take the team order and slow down to try and give George the DRS to try and help him get away. But at that point, George was already screwed and his tires were up the, up the wazoo. He was already, was already a lost cause. I saw a critique of George Russell online of he, he only believes in team orders when the team orders benefit him classic formula one driver sure but but lewis slowed down to give george drs yep at putting himself i would argue at very significant risk he very nearly lost that and he had been two seconds down the road before he slammed the anchors on to enable george to get in the drs detection zone i agree um so yeah that's uh yeah interesting to say the least okay so uh, that's us for Japan. Let's see what really spicy takes we can come up with, because we've already had a couple of slightly hot takes from the race, but let's see what we can come up with here. I mean, I think I got two for you. Uh, my first is that I think McLaren are actually a best place to be the challengers for Red Bull in 2024. I, as I said earlier, I only subscribe to this if they actually know what they're doing with the car. Like, if they actually understand the changes that they've made and why they've done what they've done and why it helps them and all those good things like that, that's the only thing that makes me pause to be willing to subscribe to this. So Mercedes tried three or four different things, and it definitely helped move them up the grid and make the car better. But, like, you know, they did their zero side pod design and then, like, tried to iterate on that before giving up on that. Then they moved to a side pod designed car. And they've tried a couple iterations on that, and they've gotten better, but not amazing. Meanwhile, I feel like McLaren, we have in the, since the ban on testing, shall we say, I don't feel like we've ever seen a car move up from the back third of the grid to the front third of the grid in one upgrade package. One package. I agree. And, and that is what makes me so concerned that they don't really understand it. I would say that because of that, they understand what's going on. Because Oof. they made such a drastic change that they, they realized something was fundamentally wrong and they found out a way to fix it. And they said, oh, this is clearly where it is. They fixed it and they've made a rocket ship. You see, that's the bit that like, I feel... The strangest thing about Formula One is it is a game of increments. Except when the regulation changes significantly, just mess everything up and make it a random number generator. It is a game of increments. You don't win by taking the radical choice, right? And that's why I feel like they aimed for, let's say, from the back to the midfield, which seems like a reasonable thing to aim for. And they've overshot to basically the second best team. And and, and I'm just I'm just cautious. I don't want to believe. If I believe, I will I will taint the opportunity in front of them because i have a lot of mclaren hats and i would love for them to be successful uh, so that i can buy even more hats yes there's a lot of mclaren on the wall behind you that i'm looking Indeed. at um but yeah i, I think I, I, can, I want to hope but i don't want to expect i mean but you were they were never going to come out and say we think this upgrade's going to shot us right to the front of the field and we're going to be battling for the podium next weekend because one we all would have laughed at them and then two if they didn't uh, if they didn't shoot up to being on the podium, we would have said, oh, that was, a, that was a crap upgrade. So I think there was some just messaging of like, yeah, we hope this is going to put us more solidly in the midfield. Because if you're sitting on a winning lottery ticket, you're not going to announce you have the winning lottery ticket. True, true. You know what? True. I matched at least three of the numbers. I matched the other three as well, but I matched at least three of the numbers. <laughs> or maybe five. They're missing the Powerball. Um, but yeah, but I think because of the moves that they've done in the season, uh, cause like Ferrari's stayed pretty static with their, their positioning versus kind of the other cars. Mercedes has stayed relatively static versus their positioning to other cars. I will agree on Mercedes, but Ferrari, Ferrari were languishing in the midfield, really struggling. They were like in fifth and sixth. And since Monza, they have, they've pulled back to the front again. I don't think 5th and 6th is languishing in the midfield. I think 10th and 11th is languishing in the midfield. Uh, maybe. I, I feel differently about Ferrari, but that, maybe that's just me. Now, 5th and 6th for Ferrari is probably languishing in the midfield, but actual languishing in the midfield, is that is not it. I, I will concede your point. So yeah, that, that was my thought on McLaren. And then my other... Cr now, this is the absolute crazy rumor. 
would be that Aston tanked the car for Lance, a la Ferrari in 2022. So if thinking back to 2022, um, originally the car was super fast for Charles and super slow for Carlos Sainz. And over their upgrades, they actually were able to pull Carlos closer to Charles to the point of now it's pretty much an equal car but it doesn't really benefit Charles in the way that it did. Charles doesn't, I don't think, likes how this Ferrari drives, even though it's, even though it's much more even between Charles and Carlos now. However, so I'm wondering if, did Big Daddy Lance Stroll decide, or Lawrence Stroll decide that, well, this world champion is outperforming my son too well, so they've tried to peg back the car more for Lance's liking, and it's just slowed the whole thing right down. Given the statements about Alonso being cranky, I can subscribe to this theory. I can believe that it was maybe not an intentional tanking per se, but intentionally moving the car towards Lance at all costs. Yes, and at the cost of any sort of pace. Which which really means breaking the car for Alonso. Uh, I would say Alonso and any other driver on the grid. Yes, I would would subscribe to that. They've turned the assists on in Formula 1 2023. Yes, they have, specifically and only for Lance Stroll. So my spicy take, my rumor, my prediction uh, is that Daniel Ricciardo will be outperformed by Liam Lawson. He'll be driving a Williams next year. And I think that is both because Liam is better than he looks and B, Williams will have improved the car even more next year and Alpha Tori will go backwards. I will say this, is, this was a bit of uh, an easier race for Liam Lawson in a Formula One car just for the sake of he's done a lot of super formula this year and they like racing at Suzuka. So he's had much more track time at Suzuka than anybody else had going into this race. Yeah, he last raced in April, I believe, was the uh, stat I heard on the TV. I, I think this is bad for Daniel Ricciardo, but I, I just there's something in there that, like, two races, Liam's been pretty good. He scored his points already as well. So I don't know. We'll see. But that's my crazy spicy take slash rumor. Well, we'll see how much uh, Lance's expert wrist surgeon messed with Daniel's wrists. Indeed. Indeed. I can't wait to see because he's back next week, right? Or not next week in two weeks' time, right? possibly i i think it's it's the earliest he can get back we'll see that will be the tell is whether they let liam racer for another race or not whether they force him back in the cat force uh, daniel back in the cat well they have i think he's got one more before he needs to go back to super formula to wrap up his super formula title i see should we wrap up and get some crazy plausible predictions for Qatar? well we have a sprint race so we shouldn't forget about that i have no predictions for the sprint race but um here's my crazy prediction Max does not wrap up the title. I'm just kidding. He'll 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 wrap it up. I I actually think this is plausible because I think there's more jeopardy involved. If you think to the end of the season, how many engines has he got? Blah blah blah, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There's definitely possibility, especially if Perez manages to sort his life out and accidentally drives into Max, or maybe Piastri. Back to the race. Lando nearly got Max because Max was too bothered by Piastri. Watch out for next week. You, it would actually be really great if Max just decided to like sit out for the rest of the season and be like, all right, Perez, you think you're hot? Sh- there you go. There is a mathematical chance for you to do this. Go get it from me. I, I, I want more drivers to do that, but I think, I think we're too, too buttoned down and too serious about this racing thing. Uh, my crazy prediction for next week, uh, I've got two here, uh, is not next week. Next race is George and Lewis end up in fifth and sixth. And then they take each other out after George has out-qualified Lewis again. Um, I think this is getting really spicy, and I think it's gonna, somebody's going to be wanting to prove a point, and they're not going to want to give, and they're all going to end up in a ditch. I'll, uh, I'll have a crazy uh, prediction for our Qatar podcast that you will still predict that George and Lewis will come together in, what, Austin? or Because this, this, this prediction has been carried forward for like three races in a row now. You need to, uh, you need to find some more balance in your life, bud. I said that George was going to bin it. This week, I am I am switching up for a direct coming together. I'm just saying, can we get at least a, a McLaren rumor in here? Maybe an Alpine rumor prediction? I've got a Williams rumor. That's next. Oh, that Sargent gets fired before Qatar? Yes, he gets taken out and Liam ends up in the Williams next week. Or next is, week. That, is that retired or, uh, or fired or is that he is not signed for 2024? I He is out of the car for the rest of the season and Liam Lawson is in the Williams. Ooh, that is bold. That is bold. Those, those 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 mechanics were ready to shank him after he bent it in qualifying. He is he is done. There is no way he's getting his contract renewed, but I think he could be out before the end of the year. Because he is expensive. He is really expensive. We are talking Latifi expensive. 
Is, is this a Game of Thrones for the watch moment where just all the mechanics go by and stab them and it's like, for the cost cap? Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, on that note, seems like a great place to end. As always, we are waiting for your feedback. Please feel free to write in at feedback at tinfoilhelmets.com. Yes, we do actually have the domain for this podcast. And uh, let us know your conspiracy theories, your feedback, and also your wants for this podcast. And as always, we need to grow our listener base for some reason, so feel free to tell your friends to like, listen, rate, subscribe, all the good things. Peace. Later.